Hello everyone, I'm Koyun and today we are going to learn from 4 chapter 14, Support and Movement in Humans and Animals. So this is basically the chapter where we learn about the bones and the locomotion. I think this chapter has a higher possibility to come up since it doesn't come out during the 2021 and 2022 SBM batch. So try to take put more focus on this chapter. Now let's take a look at this. Diagram 6 shows the human vertebral column. And yeah, there you go. Very pretty. At diagram 6, label cervical vertebrae and sacral vertebrae. So how do you actually label? So when you are doing labeling for biology, remember you have to use a pencil. I mean, if you are confident, then you just use your pen. Lah. So you must to at least give them a straight line when you're labeling. So, which one is a cervical? Which one is sacred? So they are actually right here. We got learned cervical vertebrae, and then followed by thoracic, then lumbar, and sacred. Then last but not least is the caudal. So which is which, lah? Okay, the cervical one would be, so when you are doing labeling, you try to put the one where it's majority the cervical, it will be better. So yeah, right here is cervical. And then what about the sacral? Sacral is at the one where it's, bef yeah, here. The cowder is where it's the triangular part. So before the cowder is actually the sacral part. Okay. So, other than writing the cervical, remember to write the full name. This one is sacral vertebrae. Yeah, so basically you label these two, you do the others. I'm just trying to recap with you what are those vertebrae. And then they want you to differentiate between thoracic vertebrae and lumbar vertebrae. So let me show you the picture. Yeah, this one, they didn't give you any picture to differentiate. So you probably need to have that in mind, a clear picture in mind, how the I mean, thoracic vertebrae and lumbar vertebrae look like. So based on this picture, I think it's better for you to see. Lah. But I know exams, sometimes they didn't give you, then you really have to base on what you have remembered. So for thoracic vertebrae, you have to know that is the site where most of the muscle and ligaments are attached to it. That's why it has a longer spinous process. And then followed by the transverse process. So for thoracic vertebrae, they tend to have a longer one compared to lumbar. Other than that, can you see the centrum? It is so huge. So for lumbar with the braces is at the lower part of the spine. So I mean lower part of the vertebral column, that's why it tends to be thicker, larger centrum to bear the weight of the body. So lumbar with the brain will be larger. And yeah, that's what you can actually differentiate. So long spinous process. And then this one has a short spinous process. Meanwhile, for the centrum, this one is a medium-sized centrum. And this has a large centrum. These two are the most obvious characteristic you can actually identify. Other than the spinous, another one is the transverse process okay. i'm so lazy to write <laughs> so the answer scheme that this langor paper provided is actually wrong so be careful of it when you are doing your revision um, and this one is spinous process
All right, so let's move on to the next one. Explain the role of vertebrae during the movement of the body. So what is actually the role of it? it is actually um, for the vertebral column. So during the movement of body, I mean, it actually helps to helps the body to bend, you know, and then helps for uh, movement, rotational movement. And it is also, since it has spinous process, transverse process, is a place, is a site for the muscle and ligaments to attach to it. And other than that, the bones are connected to the joint so that because of joint, this allows the bones to move. So the points you can actually write is since the bones connected to joints which allow rotational movement of body. If you think rotational movement is a bit weird, you can write the bending of body and it also acts as click side for muscles to attach attachment of muscles. For question D, a child is having deformity of leg and bones and softening leg bones and softening of both. So deformity of leg bones and softening of bone. So these are the keywords. The child has a deficiency of certain nutrition in the daily diet. So explain the relationship between the diet and the disease he suffered. So can you actually identify what is the disease he is currently suffering with? So this one got mentioning about softening of bones. So when you read the health issue related to the musculoskeletal system, um, you can actually came across this thing called osteo osteomalachia, or it's called victors when it comes to children. Lah. So they can accept both of them. Lah. So how do you explain relationship between diet? So it actually caused by lack of vitamin D or maybe lack of calcium, all those minerals, diet. So this is how you explain it. Um, the diet, lack of vitamin D causes. Because vitamin D is actually helping the absorption of the calcium and phosphorus. So causes less calcium or phosphorus so you not only have like if you want to eat a supplement you not only have to focus on the calcium and phosphorus supplement you also have to make sure you got enough vitamin d for the absorption of calcium and phosphorus so less phosphorus or calcium absorbed by body Which means that having the this child is having deficiency of calcium or phosphorus leads to so what is the disease he suffer? You can actually state it out. Leads to the child suffering with it can be either rickets or osteomalachia. So it will also lead to the bones being extremely weak now become weak 
due to Okay, so basically, it lacks of vitamin D. When you lack of vitamin D, cause the less absorption, the calcium and phosphorus. So when you have a deficiency of it, it will lead to the child having this disease, and then the bones will become weak. Okay, followed by the next question that came out in IMRSM. So yeah. There are three types of vertebrae in human vertebrae column. So can you actually identify these three of them? Maybe you might have trouble. I understand being as a student is quite hard. <laughs> yeah. So which are the most obvious characteristics for a lumbar vertebrae? So you compare. First of all, you can compare their centrum. Which has a very large centrum. This has a very large centrum, right? So the one has the largest centrum is most probably the lumbar vertebrae. Okay? Another thing you can compare is the transverse foramen. So what is actually transverse foramen? So transverse foramen is actually the site, a passage for the veins to pass through. Like there will be veins right here to pass through. So the one that has this part, yeah, a hole to it, la, <laughs> an additional hole. Yeah, this one is actually the transverse foramen. And you can see it in, you won't be seeing it in thoracic and lumbar vertebra. You will be seeing it in the cervical vertebra instead. So T is most probably the cervical vertebra. And then other than comparing which one got transfers for women, you can actually see the spinous process. Yeah, so you can see the spinous process right here. But it's also quite hard to compare. La. But normally, you can see that the thoracic one tends to be longer and yeah. But this one is hard to compare, honestly. <laughs> okay. Uh, ignore that and followed by you can see this part this is actually the facet so facet for the cervical vertebra is actually quite unique now because it is at here meanwhile for the others the facet is at here yeah so that is another difference you can differentiate them However, I rephrase my word again. I don't suggest you to use the facet to identify that because sometimes students may get confused where is the location of the facet because it got more than one location. So just ignore the facet part. You compare through the centrum and transverse foramen. So for transverse foramen, it has transverse foramen for cervical vertebrae, but for the lumbar and thoracic, they don't have transverse foramen. Meanwhile, for the centrum, is the largest for the lumbar vertebrae and other than that you can actually see the neural canal part right for neural canal it is larger for the cervical vertebrae then yeah for thoracic and the lumbar is smaller that's how you actually identify so name bone t so bone t is cervical vertebrae and they ask you to state the number of bone U, which is the thoracic vertebrae, in the vertebral column. So how are you going to state the number? Because I believe a lot of students don't be, didn't really memorize it. Lah. So no choice, we have to learn it right now. So for the cervical vertebrae, it actually has 7 and then thoracic got 12 and the lumbar got five of the vertebrae so yeah basically it has 12 of them it actually mentioned in the textbook diagram there then 
how do you want to show the comparison between vertebrae U and vertebrae T? I mean, sorry, V. So U is basically the thoracic and V is the lumbar. So it's just like just now, the question also comparing the same thing. So this one, both of them actually doesn't have transverse foramen. They just want to trick the student because student may thought that it has a transverse foramen by looking at this table. Okay, spinous process. Okay, so let's take a look at this. I hope you can identify them. So these two are actually transverse foramen. Meanwhile, for this one, the thick thick one is the centrum. This one same goes to this. This is also the centrum. And then the one pointing out this is actually the spinous process. Then this one is the transverse process. The other two pointing out transverse process. Then the one in the middle is where your is the neural canal where your spinal cord is in. So this is the neural canal. Okay. Now let's move on to the next question. An elderly woman fell down in the toilet due to slippery fall floor. Shows bone W, which is dislocated from its joint. Ouch, that is so painful. Someone is an elderly woman. So, state the type of joint involved. Alright, there are actually movable joint and immovable joint. And this one is most probably a movable joint, right? You can move it all around. And you have to see whether it can be moved. It can be rotated like three in a circular motion or it can only be moved in 180 degree means in one hinge only or it can be moved circular motion so this is you know your leg there it can actually move 360 degree a rotational movement right there right so this is actually a ball and socket joint it's not a hinge joint for hinge joint, you can take an example of your knee right there. That one, yeah, you can only move up and down, up and down. But for ball and socket joint, you can actually move it like the whole <laughs> rotational movement. So this is actually a ball and socket joint. And then... Effect of the condition of bone W on her movement. So since her joint, I mean the bone is dislocated from its joint, so you can know that her movement will be very restricted, right? So it, what is the function of the ball and socket joint? It actually allows rotational movement. So it allows your leg to move in a circular motion, can swing it around. And other than that, it will allow your leg to be lifted, your lower limb or your femur. So femur is the thick bone right there. Okay, like I'm, yeah. So our leg right here. So the thicker bone, your thigh there, that one is the femur. Yeah, below there is the tibia fibula, that part. Yeah, so this, the thick bone at your thigh right there is the femur. So, or you can say the whole thing, which is the lower limb. It's very hard to lift your lower limb. And then, yeah, you have difficulty in walking. So you can just write out your answers to it. And you can write, since, you know, the bone is dislocated already, you can mention that a rotational movement cannot be carried out or hardly to be carried out or you want to just directly state out the effect like the leg cannot move in a circular motion also can be accepted it's also from the same point cannot move 
other than that, we can say that, yeah, you are not able to lift up your leg. So, lower limb cannot be lifted. Then the walking, it the walking is very hard already, right? Since it's injured, it's dislocated, so difficult to walk or unable to walk, to walk or move properly. Then, other than that, it is very hard for the leg to be straightened and bent since this part is actually dislocated. So, yeah, a lot of restricted movement. So another point if you can if you want to add on to it is cannot be straightened or bent. So this is the effect of condition of bone W on her movement. So moving on to this Turangano paper, yeah, they basically show you this the tendon and ligament and also the same part okay the ball and socket joint so they want you to state the similarity between structure r and s so what are the similarity between structure r and s so r is actually okay how can you differentiate between tendon and ligament so tendon you have to know that is the one that connects muscle to bone tendon is the one that connects muscle to bone and then your ligament is the one that connects bone to bone so which one is connecting muscle to bone this is the muscle now obviously so muscle to your bone this is your bone so this is the tendon meanwhile for your ligament it is your bone to bone so this one connecting it the bridge okay <laughs> the bridge is the ligament yeah that's how you differentiate between them and the characteristic of them is that tendon it is inelastic and ligament it is an elastic fiber and they are both actually quite strong so these are the similarities between tendon and ligament both are strong yeah this one is the same thing uh, strong and then yeah okay so they want you to differentiate between joint p and joint q so what is joint p joint p is the one at your hand right so can your joint p right there move in 360 degree or it can only be moved one plane so you take a look at your hand right here yeah okay so it can this means one plane but it can't be moved 360 degree okay this one one plane but i can't move the whole thing like 360 degree i, I cannot perform to you lah but basically most of our hand can't move 360 degree for this part okay i'm not saying this part lah it's this part so it just allow movement 180 degree one plane only meanwhile for your leg i'm not going to show it to you um yeah for this part you can do it 360 degree is the 360 degree rotational movement so that's how you differentiate between the movable joint for hinge joint and the ball and socket joint so the another thing you can easily identify is you see this part it looks like a ball ma. and this part yeah you can't really find a nice ball to it so it's not a ball and socket joint it's just a hinge joint so the joint type is hinge joint and this is ball and socket joint so the movement is uh, one direction i mean is in one plane of movement of bone in one plane or you can say 180 degree movement of 180 degree and this one is movement this one you have to emphasize it is a rotational movement
in all directions. Or you can write it as rotation of 360 degrees. Okay, so what are the examples? So yeah, you can write the elbow. Like this one is at the elbow. Or you can write about your fingers right here. Phalanges of the fingers. Fingers. This is more than one answer. Like you can just write elbow you do. And toes. And this one is basically, you can see your shoulder joint right here. Here is a ball and socket joint. You can move like rotational movement, 360 degree. So, shoulder. Just move this part. Okay. Yeah. And for the picture, the diagram they are giving you is actually a hip joint. Okay. So just now, I think it's better to not write rotational movement. It's a bit scary now. Okay. Just write bending of body you do. Rotational is a bit... <laughs> so sorry for that. Okay. So yeah, that's the difference just between hinge and ball and socket joint. Now let's move on to this one. Shows the condition of Mr. K finger joint due to lack of production of fluid M. What is the fluid? Okay, based on your knowledge, effect of the fluid M deficiency on the joint of Mr. K. So the fluid is very less basically. So if you could identify the fluid, it is actually a synovial fluid. Synovial fluid. So the synovial fluid is actually to reduce the friction between the bones. Now. Yeah. So let's see. It actually acts as a lubricant in your joint. So yeah, it just reduces the friction. And then because of your synovial fluid decrease means it has more friction to it no? in an opposite way of explaining it. And yeah, when you want to explain this type of effect of fluid deficiency, you try to think of the role of it first, then you write it in an opposite way. Like synovial fluid, it actually acts as a lubricant to your joint. And then it actually reduces your friction. This is the role of the synovial fluid. And then, yeah, allows movement. No? But now, the synovial fluid decreases already. So, there will be a lesser lubricant. And then, it will increase your friction. Then, it will be pain. No? It will be swelling right there. And other than that, you can add on is the cartilage become worn and thick. So, there is less lubricant. In joint. This will increase the frictions, increase friction between bones. When there's more friction, right, the cartilage will actually, this is the cartilage, so the cartilage will eventually get worn out. Loud. Because the friction is small, so cartilage worn out or become thinner. La. And yeah, when there is more friction, it will become very pain, right? So there will be pain or difficulty when it comes to moving your fingers. In another way, you can write a uh, swelling at the joint. Yeah. Okay, so that's all for this question. So for question C, statement below states the explanation about bone tissue treatment method suggests a suitable nutrients to help speedy recovery of bone tissue related to the method stated. 
So what is the method? It's the carbon nanotube that are used in the orthopedic and as a scaffold for bone tissue growth, then it's an alternative treatment for bone problems other than metal implant method and the use of plaster of Paris. So basically, they are using a new method, which is carbon nanotube because it lights strong de yeah, degradation and non-toxic characteristic. So what is the suitable nutrient to help the speedy recovery of bone tissue? instead of methods stated in the above statement. So they just want you to suggest a suitable nutrients lah for the recovery of bone tissue instead of all these methods. So it's like um advising out what is the nutrients required. So for bones recovery of bone tissue, yeah basically calcium, phosphorus and vitamin D are really crucial. So intake High intake of calcium, phosphorus, or you can mention vitamin D. For growth of new bone tissue, I can say build uh, more bone cell. Repair bone cells too. So you actually want to in make your bone to be less weaker. Means you want your bone to be more quite more thicker. <laughs> so in order to say the bone to be more thicker, you are actually trying to say increase the bone mass. Thicker factor, right? We say in an increased bone mass. Okay. Or another point, you can say that this vitamin D helps for calcium absorption. Alright, so this is actually talking about nutrient. You don't have to worry on those methods that you mentioned earlier. They are just basically asking you to suggest a nutrient. So moving on for SBP paper. This one, a guy running, okay. Feed mechanism of an athlete during starting of a run. So name J and K. So J, can you see clearly what is a J? J is actually, is it a muscle? No, you zoom in properly. You can see that this muscle and this is the bone, right? This is the muscle. And? What is the thing that connects between muscle and bone? It is the tendon. Meanwhile, what is your K? This one you forget then really, <laughs> really bye bye to your mark. Lah. This is actually your femur. So the bone in your thigh, right, is actually femur. Okay, so tendon, femur. And this one is actually a quadriceps femoris muscle. This one is a bicep femoris muscle for your information. All right, now let's take a look at the function of J. So what is the function of J? So yeah. You can just straight away write connect bone and muscle. Yeah, one mark to you. Then the athlete fall during running so causes your ten the tendon to tear. Tendon tear. So how it affects the movement of the athlete. So the tendon is the one that connects between bone and muscle, right? So when actually for tendon, right, it actually helps for the movement of your bone and which is your leg to be specific for this situation. So right now how it affects means your movement will be very difficult, no? So movement is 
difficult or you can write that it's very difficult to bend the leg or you can feel the pain when moving. Bend leg at knee joint. Okay, how do you actually explain why is it difficult to bend the leg at the knee joint? Because, right, okay, since this one is your bicep femoris, okay, you have to think in the mechanism of it. Lah. So, when the bicep femoris contract, so bicep femoris, uh, for your information, it is the flexor. So, when this muscle contract, bicep femoris, which is the flexor that contract, it will actually lead to the pulling force. So, the pulling force, yeah, the pulling force, okay. So, the tendon right here, it will actually transmit the pulling force to the bone through this tendon. So you transmit the pulling force to the bone through tendon, but now your tendon is injured, okay? It's tear off already. So you have to say that your pulling force cannot be transmitted. So when the pulling force cannot be transmitted, because when your bicep contract, it will lead to your leg will be bent, right? But now, Okay, pulling force. So when it cannot con I mean it can contract, just that it's unable to transmit the pulling force. So it leads to the leg unable to be bent. Okay, so the femur will not be pulled at that. So pulling force cannot this one they put it in a leg situation so students may have a hard time understanding it because compared to the elbow that part the shoulder that part yeah it's more easy to explain but this one they are moving it to the leg situation so you have also the same explanation just that you have to understand well which one is the one contracting and then where is the pulling force headed to so pulling force cannot be transmitted to bone by tendon since the tendon is torn. So the bone or you can write in specific femur cannot be be put. Okay. So that's the reason why it is very difficult to bend the leg at the knee joint. There's also an additional point they have given. More weight will be, be added on other leg, which will lead to your body imbalance when walking. Now. Because walking you really need to like bend your leg. So yeah, it will be very hard to walk. So body will be imbalanced by walking. Now let's differentiate between joint I and joint L. Let's take a look, where is it? So joint I is actually the one at your hip right there, hip joint. And this one is actually your knee joint. So your knee joint, this one, remember your patella reflex, you hit the, and then it will like, ooh. Okay. So yeah, this one is the knee joint. And it can only be moved in uh, 180 degree, one plane. Meanwhile, for this hip joint, it can actually move 360 degree because there is a ball and socket joint. So, joint I is joint I
is your hip joint, which is a ball and socket joint. Wow. Joint L is the one at the knee. Knee. Eh, knee pula. Sorry, sorry, sorry. A uh, hinge joint. So for joint I, it will allow rotational movement. Wow. Joint L allow movement in one plane only. You want to write 360 degree while the other is 180 also can. One plane. So when you are doing differentiate, don't forget to write the keywords right here, while or whereas. So this one, they will just give you one mark. Yeah, this one is an external answer. Another accepted answer. Now let's move on to Negeri Sembilan paper. Diagram 7 shows a forearm with joints Q and R. So name joints Q and R. So what is Q and R joint? Yeah, so you can see the pattern right here. They kept asking about joint. So this one is your shoulder joint. So yeah, if you don't know how to differentiate during exam, you just go and move your hand. Lah. <laughs> no, lah. Okay, don't, don't cause any disturbance to your other friend. But yeah, you just try to move it. See, can it be moved 3 hours 60 degree or move in one plane only? So obviously, this one, it can only move in one plane unless you have the special uh, joint. But yeah, most of the situation, we have the hinge joint at this part, elbow. Meanwhile, for shoulder, we have a ball and socket joint. So for Q, we mention it as ball and socket joint. And R is hinge joint. So two characteristic of P that helps in the movement of R. So what is actually P? Remember, the one that connecting muscle to your bone is your tendon. The one connecting your bone and your bone, bone and your bone, this one is your ligament. Okay. And then the one connecting with the muscle, sorry, the muscle and the bone is your tendon. Yeah. So, two characteristics of P. P is basically tendon that helps in the movement of arm. So, it is actually strong, right? Both tendon and ligament are strong fibers. Then, another thing you can write is it is inelastic. But for ligament, it is actually elastic. That's the differences between them. So, it is in elastic. Another thing you can write is it flexible. A lorry driver had a road accident and caused P on his arm to be torn. So it's also the same situation where the tendon is torn but now it's at the uh, elbow there. So what is the effect on the movement and then explain your answer. So First of all, you you mentioned state what is the effect of the movement. Movement cannot take place, no? So movement in arm cannot take place. Or you can write cannot bend and straighten the arm. So they have given you that the bicep and then here is your radius. Yeah, this one is your radius. So, as you think of this situation, lah, okay, during the bending of arm, right, what happens first? Your bicep contract. So, when your bicep contract, your tricep relax because it's an antagonistic 
muscle ma. one contract another one relax so if you transmit a full force you will be transmit to which bone it actually will since this one bicep is the one contracting so it will transmit to the radius bone so transmit to the radius through what through this tendon So that your radius is pulled upward. So when your radius is pulled upwards, it will cause the bending of arm. However, now they said that the tendon is torn, right? Yeah, torn. So when your tendon is torn, specifically it's at the P, yeah, it's at P. So this tendon is torn. So you have to write. This part you don't have to write. Like, you say that the pull force unable to transmit to the radius because the tendon is torn. Like. And then the radius cannot be put upward. Bending of arm cannot take place. Yeah, these are the three points you can just really write it out so right here movement of arm cannot take place or you can say bending of arm cannot occur take place so why because the biceps um uh, is not attached to radius since the tendon is the one that connecting the muscle to the bone right this one is the muscle this one is the bone so the tendon torn so it is not attached the muscle and bone are not attached together but you have to be specific which is biceps and the radius so yeah let's continue the explanation full force cannot be transmitted is not transmitted to radius or you want to write bone through the tendon p or you can write it as tendon so the radius cannot be pulled upwards that's the reason why bending of arm cannot take place so you can actually state first then you explain it since this one is four marks you have to explain in detail so one two three four so it's actually almost quite similar to the leg one okay difficult to bend the leg why because the pull force cannot be transmitted to the boot by tendon so it cannot be put the specific bone cannot be put and yeah that causes the bending leg to be very difficult moving on to this paper further paper is talking about this worm and fish fish so they have skeletal system and show unique mechanism of locomotion and produced by contraction of antagonist pair and aided by their structure based on their based on diagram complete the table below so there are actually three types of skeleton endoskeleton exoskeleton hydrostatic skeleton so this one is basically the hydrostatic skeleton exoskeleton is normally the one where insects have it and maybe the crab yeah those shell eh, shellfish pull up the crab lobster and then antagonistic muscle pair so you have to know what are the pairs of it so for fish we actually learn the fish muscle is mitotone so you can actually add on left and right since they need a pair muscle. 
yeah, we do we didn't learn what is the specific, but yeah, it's in left and right, like it is right, left and right. But for the worm worm, it's a circular and longitudinal muscle. Then the external structure, like morphological structure, other than antagonistic muscle. So the worm is the heat day. But for the fish fish, you can see what are other things that help it other than their skeleton. They got this right, the fin and the tail. Fin is actually help the direction, tail is the one that weak here, weak there. So yeah, it can be tail or the fins. Alright, so let's take a look at this. When you put the worm on a smooth towel, is that an earthworm? Probably the prosthetic movement on the body segment occurs. So you can contract and relax, but it cannot move away and maintain at the position. So they want you to explain why. Okay. Why it cannot move and it will still maintain at the same position. Alright, so you. Take a look at the keywords for this question. The keyword is actually they put it in a smooth and white towel. So for physics, right, when they say smooth, you know that there is zero friction. Okay, <laughs> you assume it's zero friction. Huh? So you can mention that this white towel is very slippery. It's slippery. So when it's very slippery, let's say you are human, you know, you walk across something very slippery, your leg can't like really support, I mean, not support lah, but cannot really grip the floor well and then you eventually fall down lah. Um, for earthworm, they actually have this thing called heating ma, a little leg, tiny leg. So basically, their heating cannot really grip on the towel properly. So the earthworm will eventually uh, can't move. Lah. I mean, cannot be put forward. So the whole explanation is actually quite long. Um, I will just write it out to you right here. They can actually still contract their muscle. Contraction of longitudinal muscle make the anterior or you can write posterior worm thicken and shorten shorter and thicker shorter thicker and shorter and then the heat day at the anterior and posterior cannot grip or you can write cannot anchor to the towel so causing posterior part unable to be put forward that's the reason why the worm will like slip backwards and it cannot move from the tower area. Worm thus worm cannot move from tall area as it slip backwards. So this is a very complete answer. Yeah. So the main thing is the towel is too slippery. The heat day cannot really grip it well. That's why when it want to move forward, it end up cannot grip well. Then yeah, we slip backwards. So there's no movement for use in the end. Okay. Now let's take a look at this one about a gymnastic athlete holding a pair of horizontal bow. 
describe what happens to the athlete bicep and tricep muscle and his forearm to hold the position in diagram 8.2. So this is basically talking about, let's see, can you see this part? Does it look like straightened to you? No, it looks like bending, right? So what is the bending, uh, <laughs> bending action? Yeah, you basically have to explain the whole thing out. So biceps contract. Because they want you to mention both bicep and tricep. And it's better for you to mention both lah for a complete answer. Well, triceps relax since it is an antagonistic pack. So cooling force is transmitted to radius. Through tendon radius foot upwards, and then then thing of forearm um, occur. Okay, so that's how you actually explain. So what about straightening of the arm? So if you want to explain straightening of arm, it's actually the opposite. Like biceps will be relaxed while your tricep contract. Pulling force will transmit to another type of bone, is the ulna, through the tendon, and then your ulna pull upwards. Straightening of the forearm occur. So let's move on to this part. So you can see the clavicle scapula. Okay, he broke his clavicle ouch as shown by this diagram. So discuss one suitable method of treatment. You are the doctor. How are you going to treat them? So normally when you injure your arm, or maybe sometimes you see your friend just wear the What's the thing? The arm sling. And you're like, what happened? What happened? Yeah. That's probably one of the treatment. Now. <laughs> okay. So you wear the arm sling after the fracture to keep your arm and shoulder in a position to let the injury heal itself. Now. So if you didn't wear arm sling, like you keep moving here and there, maybe sometimes you may even injure it and worsen the injury, aggravate the injury. And another thing you can actually use like install device to it. So, where, um, keep your arm and shoulder in position. You don't want it to move around now the injury healing itself. Another one is the surgery. Install a fixation device to hold the fractured bone in original position. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Yeah, so hope this guy gets to heal as soon as possible. Have a speedy recovery. So for this Malacca paper, diagram 9.1 shows type of joint. Also the same thing about joint. So I mentioned a lot of times. I yeah hope you really understand how to really differentiate between them. So this one is basically at the hip one, and you see this ball, and it can rotate 360 degree. So it is a ball and socket joint. Meanwhile, for joint B is actually at your knee, because you can see femur. Femur is the one at your thigh, right? Yeah. 
So this, you can only move in one plane. So it is a hinge joint. So how can you compare and contrast between joint A and B? So here is the answer. In order to state their similarities, both actually can be moved. So both are freely movable joints. And then allow free movement. You are not specific yet, man. It's just free movement. And yeah, because joint, they contain synovial fluid, cartilage, all these things, right? So you can write both also consists of this. And differences between them, yeah, the last rotational movement in all direction. This one is only in one plane. And this one is at the shoulder and the hip at the phalanges. Yeah. Wait, did they actually mention? No, right? Yeah, you can write this one is uh, joint A is actually a ball and socket joint. And joint B is a hinge joint. That's another very obvious point to it. Moving on, they want you to explain movement of leg that is produced by the action of antagonistic muscle during walking. Eight marks right there. So if you forget, then really gg.com. But you try to think lah. Because this one, they didn't have a diagram to help you out. So it really based on how you can illustrate, I mean, imagine it out and all your memorization. But most importantly, you have to understand before you memorize it. So basically, you need to involve a pair of antagonistic muscle. So what are the antagonistic muscle you have to involve? It's actually the bicep femoris and the quadricep femoris. Bicep femoris is at here, quadricep femoris is at here. Okay, so first of all, you mentioned who are the antagonistic muscle. Bicep femoris is the flexor, while the quadriceps femoris is the extensor. Then you only start your sentence. Okay. So, first of all, your right calf muscle right here, it will contract. So, after your right calf muscle contract, it will lift your heel and then the ball of foot will be pushes against the ground ball of foot pushes against the ground so it like pushes it up like, against the ground so you will eventually yeah pushes against the ground and then gonna yeah lift the heel then you want to explain the bending motion so the at the same time the bicep femoris contract and then the let's see okay, uh bicep femoris contracts and then it will bend on because the flexor is the one that contract which leads to the bending motion so bending the foot at the base. Okay, after you bending the foot at the base, it's time for you to, yeah, straightening your calf. So when you want to straighten your leg right here, okay, for straightening motion is where your extensor going to do its job, which is your quadricep femoris in detail. So quadricep femoris contracts to straighten your leg. Okay, last but not least, how do they actually bring down the heel? It's actually through this, oh my god, so sorry for that. <laughs> through tibialis. Okay, so yeah. Tibialis contracts to bring down the heel. Then the whole sequence is repeated by the left leg. So you can actually refer to your textbook to revise back this walking motion. And followed by the last question right here, the spring structure X helps in the movement mechanism of a fish. So this is basically a myotome. So for myotome, 
you actually have to explain this part. The right and left, and then, yeah. So, this is a brief explanation for you. When the right hand side here, it contract, the right myotone contract, it will actually pull the tail to the right. Pull tail to the right. And the tail will weep to the right. Okay. What about when your myotome on the left hand side contract? It's actually the same thing. Pull the tail to the left. Tail is weak to the left. Yeah. It's like wrapping like that. So how structure X helps in the movement? Basically, it's the myotome. So the fish vertebral column is flexible. This is the first point. And then the second point right here, it can be moved from side to side by contraction and relaxation of structure X. Or you can say what is the structure of the myotome is W-shaped. And then myotome muscle, they also act antagonistically in opposite or opposite action. But it's better to write antagonistically. So this enable the fish to whip its tail. So you can explain in detail when the right myotome muscle contract, the myotome muscle on the left hand side will relax. Because it's an antagonistic action. So one contract, another one relax. So when the right one contract, you know what happened to the tail? It will be weak to the right. Or you want to write it in a left hand side way, vice versa, where your left contract and then the tail will be weak to the left also can. But it's also from the same point. Then because of this wave of keep contracting and relaxation that occur along the structure X, which is your myotome, it will actually let your the fish body to move from side to side. This action causes parts of body to move from side to side. So yeah, basically you keep pushing the water and then when you push the water backwards, right? If you learn physics, the physics, uh, Newton third law of motion, <laughs> <laughs> Don't write the Newton to But basically when the when the fish tail yeah all this pushing water backwards there will be a an opposite direction force acting on it lah. So it will cause the pushing force for the fish to move forward. <laughs> so yeah, moving the fish forward. So um, external point you actually can add on is the fins lah, because the fins are the one that control the fish direction and the movement. Okay, so I know this one is quite overwhelming a bit, since this one provided eight marks for this. But most importantly, you have to know the how it acts antagonistically, and yeah, this most importantly is the myotome and how they act. With each other and how it eventually pushed the fish forward moving the fish forward so it's basically because of contraction and relaxation of the myotome okay so for this chapter you actually have to focus a lot on the joints because they kept asking you to yeah and the tendon and ligament and yeah basically these are all the frequent questions that came out and i just um, compiled it together so and what happens if the tendon is torn what happens to the movement and then yeah that's all for this chapter and thank you so much for watching this video i hope you get to gain some help knowledge through this chapter so thank you so much and then i'll see you in the next video don't forget to subscribe and watch my other video as a support okay bye bye